Nature is made possible by public television stations. By Siemens, a leader in high technology electronics and electrical engineering. Nationwide, 27,000 Americans in 400 locations. The name is Siemens. And by your gas company and America's gas industry, bringing natural gas through a million miles of underground pipelines to 160 million people. These fascinating animals are lemurs. They're the closest living examples we have of the early mammals that later evolved into monkeys, apes, and eventually man. Hi, I'm George Page for Nature, and lemurs are just one of the many unique creatures found only on the island of Madagascar, a biological wonderland in the Indian Ocean that broke away from the east coast of Africa over a hundred million years ago. Because of the many years of isolation, life in Madagascar has evolved in ways quite different from mainland Africa. In addition to the lemurs, there are hundreds of varieties of plants and animals that exist only on the island. But since man arrived, many of these unique species have died out in the classic struggle for survival between ever-increasing numbers of people and a dwindling wildlife population. Fortunately, the government of Madagascar is now seeking help for ways both to feed its human population and to preserve the many wonderful forms of life the island still contains, including these fellows, the remarkable lemurs of Madagascar. The forests of Madagascar abound with plant and animal life found nowhere else on earth, but none more intriguing and charming than the lemurs, whose name originates from the Latin word meaning ghostly spirits. There are more than 20 existing species of lemurs in a great variety of shapes, sizes, and colors. Despite their dog-like appearance, lemurs are primates, an early branch of our own family tree that provides valuable clues to human origins. Their eyes face forward just like ours, giving them the binocular vision so helpful when judging distances among the trees. Their hands are also similar, with thumbs opposed to the fingers, ideal for gripping branches and reaching for food. With an especially keen sense of smell, lemurs use their noses much more than other primates, but are similar in giving birth to a well-developed baby which is carried around like this for several months. All primates groom each other, not only to clean their fur, but also as a friendly act, which helps maintain the bond between relatives. But as an example of the quite separate way lemurs have evolved, they use a special combing tooth instead of their hands. From a very young age, lemur infants need to practice and develop the agility 
that will help them to move safely on their own among the trees. Some lemurs, particularly ringtails like these, spend part of the day on the ground. Their long tails held high like beacons might enable a troop to keep together as they travel through the forest. Mothers carrying very young babies slung under their bellies often lead the way. In lemur society, females are dominant. After three or four weeks, the youngsters change to a jockey position. There's a better view from here. At least for those who climb on the right way. If instead of ringtails, these were vervet monkeys or baboons, then the scene would be reminiscent of East Africa. But lemurs are not true monkeys and have only evolved to this degree on the tropical island of Madagascar. A thousand miles long and about 300 miles wide, Madagascar is thought to have broken away from mainland Africa about 200 million years ago and drifted eastward with a cargo of primitive animals and plants. Evolution continued for millions of years in isolation so that the lemurs of today, together with most of the other animals and plants on the island, are found nowhere else but here. Here in the south, the occasional large river fed by rain in the distant mountains is virtually the only water in an otherwise arid country. Along each bank grows a fringe of lush, riverine forest. Most of the large trees, like tamarind and acacias, are deciduous and provide edible flowers, fruits, and leaves for the lemurs. Lemurs share the canopy with many species of birds that are also unique to this island continent, the sickle-billed vanga. It uses its unusual bill to pluck insects from bark, taking the place of the woodpecker here. The Madagascar magpie robin whose song is a familiar refrain everywhere on the island. And the Madagascar sparrow hawk, the exotic equivalent to our common kestrel. But not all members of the feathered tribe are distinctive native species. Birds find it easier to broach the island's isolation. This hoopoe could be just as at home in Europe. Five species of lemurs share this particular forest bordering a river. Two are nocturnal, while the other three are active during the day, more like the true monkey. Ringtails are the most conspicuous lemurs here. They live in closely knit troops, averaging 10 to 12 animals, but occasionally with more than 20. Females form the central core of any troop and rarely desert to another. It's only the males that will sometimes move away.
Members of each troop mark the boundaries of their home range with a distinctive smell. In this case, it's a female using the scent gland at the base of her tail. Another of the species active in the daytime has the common name Shifak because of their characteristic alarm call. Like ringtails, each Shafak troop relies heavily on scent marking to define its home range. This male applies scent to a branch, in this case with a special throat gland, and then carefully checks the effect with his nose. Satisfied that one aroma has infused the bark, he smears a different scent from his tail gland over the same place. Like most lemurs, a ring-tailed mother will suckle her offspring for three to four months. But even when a few weeks old, infants spend more and more time exploring on their own. Or joining others in energetic play. Despite their natural agility, at this age, poor judgment sometimes leads to a serious fall. This youngster eventually died from its injuries. Occasionally, twins are born, which can indicate an especially rich supply of food in the area. This pair is eating the mud from a termite mound, perhaps for the salts it contains. Ringtails spend many hours on or near the ground. It's cooler down here, especially in the middle part of the day. On the forest floor, they will eat herbs, flowers, and even cobwebs. But the staple diet is the pods of the tamarind tree, known locally as kili. The kili is broken open to get at the nourishing, sticky fruit which surrounds each seed. The possession of choice food or the ability to take pieces from other animals, often aggressively, is one of the ways lemurs affirm their status within a troop. Males and females each have separate orders of rank, but females are always dominant over males. This male has a killie in his hand, which the approaching female decides she would like for herself. With very little resistance, the male gives up the choice pod. But the arrival of a red-fronted lemur might cause her some trouble. When red-fronted lemurs and ringtails share the same forest, aggressive confrontations like this occur most often at favorite feeding sites. After some resistance, the ringtail finally moves off, 
and the rest of the red-fronted troop will now descend to the ground to search for food. Females have gray patches on their foreheads, whereas a male can be identified by his reddish crown. Newborn infants are attractive to all members of their troop, and this one is getting attention from an adult male, something more likely with red-fronted lemurs than other species. These youngsters are always carried across the body instead of longwise like ringtails. Foraging among the leaf litter, red-fronted lemurs have a wider diet than the other species. Besides leaves, flowers, and fruits, they will also eat fungi and various invertebrates, including millipedes and spiders when they can find them. There is also a bird, the Madagascar giant kua, that follows close by, catching insects disturbed by the troop. Both red-fronted and ringtails need to drink regularly, either directly from the river, if it's within their range, from the hollows of large trees where rainwater has collected, or by licking the dew off leaves. The verdant woodland where these lemurs live grows only in a narrow strip parallel to the river where the tree roots can reach the water table. Beyond, where the land rises much higher above the water level, there stretches a vast area of totally different vegetation. From a distance, it appears quite similar only a closer look reveals the true nature of this unique and remarkable forest. Here are mighty water-retaining baobabs, seven species compared to mainland Africa's one. And strange trees belonging to the Didieria family. Although they might look like cacti, they have the woody trunks of true trees, which can be cut into planks. Waxy, succulent leaves appear only after one of the infrequent rainfalls, so that for most of the year, the vicious thorns are the most noticeable feature. The majority of plants here have protective spines of one kind or another, so it's little wonder that the area is sometimes called the spiny forest. In this region, it's extremely hot, dry, and prickly, the sort of place where you might expect only reptiles and insects, like this cicada, to survive. It seems remarkable, then, to find Shifox here, clinging nonchalantly to the thorny stem. How they avoid wounding their soft palms and feet when they leap between the spine-covered branches is a complete mystery.
In this virtually waterless area, ringtail and red-fronted lemurs would find it very difficult to survive, whereas shifox flourish here. The secret is that shifox do not drink water directly. They have the ability to extract all the moisture they require from their vegetarian diet. In this case, the leathery leaves of solanum, a relative of the tomato family. The spiny forest is one of the world's most unusual places, an area unique even by Madagascan standards. For an astonishing 95% of all the plants and many of its creatures live nowhere else but here. It's only after one of the rare rainstorms that flowers appear. And at these moments, Diddy areas bloom so vigorously that every square inch seems crammed with blossoms. The flowers of an aloe attract a swallowtail butterfly. The sudden glut of nectar brings seasonal visitors, like this pair of green sunbirds. While a flurry of monarch butterflies brightens the scene around a flowering milkweed vine. Most of the year, the spiny forest is seemingly uninviting, and yet the Shifak alarm calls give notice of other residents that have found ways of surviving here. A pair of Madagascar Harrier hawks is nesting high up in a towering baobab tree. They are yet another species peculiar to this island. They would gladly take a baby shifak to feed their own young, so the troops' distress is understandable. Yet there is another, more formidable predator here that also alarms the troops. This area is also the traditional homeland of the Tandroi, the people of the thorns. Growing enough food in such an arid region is always difficult, especially for those villagers who are farthest from a river. The food could be supplemented by lemur hunting, but the Tandroi are herders, and they have strong religious fadis, or taboos, against killing certain wild animals, including lemurs. There's another problem, however, which leads to conflict between humans and wildlife, the age-old one of intensive grazing. Throughout Madagascar, livestock is accumulated as a sign of wealth. Of course, the animals do provide milk and meat, but the domestic herds are kept mainly to pay for marriages and funerals. 
a bank balance on the hoof. Goats let loose in the forest are very destructive, browsing just about anything they can reach. Seedlings have little chance to mature, and where livestock movement is heavy as along this route to the river, the unfortunate result can be seen clearly. Problems such as overgrazing are always difficult to solve when poverty is a way of life. For the moment, the few remaining forests of these parched southern lands are still a precious living resource but they are under pressure and will survive only if there's a concerted conservation effort. The river which sustains cattle and people also keeps alive the narrow strip of forest that's home to a great diversity of wildlife, of which only the lemurs have received international attention. The natural reservoir, which is the source of this vital water, is a place permanently lush and humid. The distant rainforest of the eastern mountains with unique animals of its own. Perhaps the true spirits of the rainforest are the largest of all Madagascar's lemurs, the Indri, which proclaim their family territories with an eerie song. Adult injury are the size of a three-year-old child with an uncomplimentary local name, Babakoto, meaning the stupid one, the ancestor who stayed in the trees. And injury do indeed spend most of their time in the forest canopy eating leaves. Although, as with all lemurs, injury have evolved in isolation from other primates, their lifestyle in some ways parallels that of the gibbons of Southeast Asia. Both gibbons and Indri live in small family groups with males and females pairing for life. And both communicate with other groups using loud vocal songs. Instead of swinging from their arms as gibbons do, Indri use powerful thrusts of their long hind legs to leap through the trees. As in all tropical rainforests, the natural variety of plant and animal life on display here is abundant and often colorful. And again, much of it specific to Madagascar. This elegant russet creature is one of only seven species of carnivore native to Madagascar, all of which are related to the mongoose. It's called a galidia, or ring-tailed mongoose, another Madagascan exclusive. 
No cats, dogs, or hyenas were found here originally because they hadn't yet evolved when the island sailed off into isolation. The Galidia live in pairs, actively scouring all levels of the forest for fruits, insects, eggs, and even small reptiles. The eastern rainforest is also home to a great variety of lemurs. These are diadem shifox, larger than the shifox of the dry south, but not as big as the Indri. There are a number of smaller, less noticeable lemurs in the rainforest. This one is called the red-bellied lemur. One of the most elusive has rarely been observed by Western scientists. They're called the broad-nosed gentle lemurs, and they live almost exclusively on bamboo. They prefer tender shoots, but will also tackle large stems with their sharp teeth in order to feed on the softer interior walls. Vast stretches of Madagascan rainforest have already been felled, so the areas that do remain have a greater importance than ever, not merely as living museums of rare wildlife, but as a vital source of water for the drier lands elsewhere. The downpours of rain are absorbed by the vegetation and soil like a giant sponge and then gradually released to form the many tumbling streams. Concentrated eventually into wide sandy waterways, such as this one in the far south, the mountain rainwater gives life to the riverine forests and their inhabitants. It is April. The brief rainy season is almost over, and the ringtails warm themselves after a cool night. For ringtails, this is the mating season, which lasts for only two weeks each year. During this brief period, individual females are receptive to mating for only a single day. And for males, their distinctively patterned tails take on a new purpose in rituals that lead to courtship and mating. Males have yet another scent gland on the inside of each wrist, the visible dark patch there and again on another male. These glands, together with others near the armpits, exude a sticky substance with a powerful individual scent, which when smeared onto the tail can be used for what is appropriately called a stink fight. With a shiver of the tail overhead, rival males waft their personal scent at each other. Stink fights and chases confirm the status of each male, usually without the need for physical combat. With a rival temporarily deterred, a dominant male also uses his scented tail to approach a desirable female. In this case, she seems uninterested. Apparently, she's not yet fully receptive. whereas another female, ready for mating, advertises her interest 
and encourages male attention with contact calls. The sound, sight, and smell of a receptive female in the tree above results in a frenzy of scent marking by this male. Anything at hand is marked as if to surround himself by his own scent and perhaps create a barrier to deter other males from following. As he approaches the receptive female, the horny spurs which project from his wrist glands are used to gouge scent into the bark of a liana. Nearby, a rival takes up the challenge. All this excitement encourages some juvenile males to mimic their elders and play. In the adult world above, one of the males is now shadowing the receptive female. As she moves through the treetops, she leaves her own scent mark. The male follows her more and more closely until eventually she rests and adopts a mating position. But before mating can take place, an unwelcome visitor interrupts. It's the rival male approaching from below. With the intruder seen off, the consorting male makes another ritual approach, this time without interruption. The rival male is frustrated, having spent most of the day trying unsuccessfully to claim the female for himself. Giving up altogether, he leaves the courting pair who mate many more times before sunset. At the end of the day, when the two of them finally part company, the male relaxes, grooming himself thoroughly in the twilight. Once the forest is dark, the nocturnal lemurs emerge from their daytime hiding places. This one is a lepi lemur. The size of a rabbit, lepi lemurs occur in seven distinct races throughout Madagascar. They're one of the smallest primates with a solely vegetarian diet, 
And unlike the diurnal lemurs, levee lemurs are solitary, communicating most notably with loud screeching calls. Another nocturnal lemur found in these forests is the smallest living primate in the world, the lesser mouse lemur, weighing on average a mere two ounces, little more than a chicken's egg. They exist on a high energy diet of insects and ripe fruit and bear twin young, which unlike other lemurs are born blind and are sheltered in a nest. Foraging in the leaf litter below is an animal that looks remarkably similar to a European hedgehog. In fact, it's no relation, but one of a family of insectivores, the tenrex, again native only to Madagascar. One species of tenrex can rub the stiff spines on its back in a kind of supersonic alarm call. By dawn, it will retire to the safety of a burrow. The local belief that lemurs are worshippers of the sun is especially relevant to the ringtails and shafox, who sit with their arms outspread, chest facing the warming rays. Although early morning is one of the most active feeding periods for the ring-tail lemurs, they will often stop to rest in a patch of sunlight, warming themselves in their own effective way. The lemurs are not hunted by humans in this forest, so except for dogs brought here by man, the major threat comes from overhead. Some local birds of prey are capable of catching young lemurs. If the ringtails spot a hawk nearby, their concern is considerable. Alarm spreads through the forest. Lemur alarm calls help recruit a drongo, a native crow-like bird which mobs the retreating hawk. Once the word is out and the troop is aware of the hawk's position, he poses little threat. 
Chastened, he keeps a wary eye on his Drongo escort. When Shifox are on the move, their supreme agility and precision in the trees can be seen clearly. Shifox are vertical leapers, relying on powerful rear legs to push off with and large feet to clamp onto the branches. Front limbs are used for steadying and balance. When a gap between trees is too wide to cross in midair, Shifox often climb down and continue along the ground in their own eccentric way. Disproportionately long legs evolved for movement in the trees makes running on all fours impossible. For Shifox, bouncing sideways seems the only alternative. But for a youngster, the method must be first learned and then perfected. With an adult, it's like viewing a gymnastic ballet. With the youngster, it's more like watching a child in a sack race. As with all young primates, Shafat juveniles spend many hours of the day playing. Feeding and playing on the ground is common for many Shifak troops, but only when the forest floor is clear of predators or human disturbance. And even then, they are constantly vigilant. forest can become stiflingly hot when the sun is at its highest, and Shifox habitually seek the coolest spots for a midday siesta.
In a nearby Tandroy village, many of the people are also at rest, while an evening meal boils up in the cooking shed. The human population of Madagascar is 10 million, double that of 25 years ago. Only those few species that can live in close quarters with man are holding their own, but even their success may be brief. There is a weaver bird colony in a tree close to the chief's hut, a sign of good fortune. Water is precious here, yet it's offered to the birds a symbol of goodwill. But more than goodwill is needed for both man and nature to prosper in Madagascar. The fates of both man and wildlife are inextricably entwined. They both depend on the natural ecosystems that keep this land productive. But this intricately woven fabric of life is rapidly becoming undone. In their struggle for survival, the burgeoning human population is slashing and burning the forests. Not only is this rapidly devouring the homes of hundreds of unique species, but it's taxing the ability of the land to support its human population as well. Madagascar has been called the most eroded place on earth. There's a constant shortage of even the most basic supplies like fuel for cooking and warmth. More food is needed to support the growing population and more timber for constructing houses or for converting into charcoal. All these needs might be met by an improved use of resources, but today there is immense pressure on the remaining forests. When rainforest is felled in watershed areas, the steady supply to the rivers is reduced, triggering droughts many miles away in the arid south. When spiny forest is cleared, the poor soil soon turns into a baking desert of little use to people, cattle, or wild animals. Little remains of the deciduous forest that once fringed the banks of the great southern rivers. Sadly, 80% of all Madagascar's forests has been cleared. Local people are often aware of how forest clearance affects the future for themselves and for lemurs. But locked in a deepening cycle of poverty and ecological collapse, there's usually little they can do to stop it. International funds are urgently needed for sensible development as well as conservation. And more local pride and national awareness is vital in the crucial battle to save the forests for people and animals alike. Since man arrived here, 14 species of lemurs have disappeared and a new wave of extinctions may be unfolding. Unless we care enough about the problems facing the people of Madagascar and their wildlife, it's possible that within a lifetime, the lemurs, instead of being the living spirits of the forest, will exist only as ghostly shadows in textbooks and films. Nature is made possible by public television stations, your gas company, and the gas industry, whose respect for nature and the environment is reflected in the underwriting of this series. America's gas industry provides 160 million people with natural gas energy all across the country. And by Siemens, a leader in electronics and electrical engineering, 27,000 employees, 47 manufacturing facilities. The name is Siemens.
This is PBS.